I am so pleased to be joined today by artist Joanna Manousis and curator and scholar Christopher Kit Maxwell. Um, Joanna joins us from um, outside of Toledo, Ohio, is that right? Yes. Um, and Kit is in London, back, back home in London. So um, thank you everybody for joining us all over the country and from Europe and um, somebody, some people I'm seeing from Australia. Hello to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> good evening. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce our speakers and then we will um, get going. Um, we are super pleased to have um, Joanna Manousis uh, with her, with, with us today. Um, Joanna is um, an, an artist, uh, British born. We have just um, opened her first exhibition in September. Joanna received her BFA from the University of Wolverhampton in England and an MFA in sculpture from Alfred University in New York. She has uh, received support from internationally recognized residency programs, including the Glass Pavilion at the Toledo Museum of Art in Ohio and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, as well as the Corning Museum of Glass, where she worked, was it a few years ago, did you say, Joanna? Um, it was 2014, I, 12, 2014, yeah, the years, yeah. Several years ago. Um, her work has been exhibited at Design Miami at, um, uh, Art Basel in Switzerland, at uh, Fog Art and Design in San Francisco, at the Glass Museum in Abeltoft, um, and at the British Glass Biennial in Stourbridge, England. And it is held in private and public collections in the United States and Europe, including the Toledo Museum of Art and the Glass Museum um, in Abeltoft in Denmark. Our first exhibition with Joanna uh, focuses on uh, her wall installations in particular to demonstrate the breadth of her um, technical mastery, but also her art historical literacy. It, the pieces showcase her curiosity about process and her willingness to test its versatility. Yeah. And ultimately they um, entice, in my opinion, by harnessing beautifully mirrored light to provide reflection and a space for self-reflection. Um, Susie Silbert, uh, Corning's uh, curator of contemporary glass, uh, wrote about her that adopting the form of a cathedral's rose window, but replacing the passive transmission of light with an optic ref reflectivity in these pieces, Manousis emphasizes the universal universality, excuse me, and interconnection between all people reflected collectively. We are each individual kernels and a unified totality whose power is delivered not from an unseen force above, but rather through the collective refraction of the gilded light within. And um, Christopher uh, Maxwell, Kit Maxwell, uh, is currently the curator of early modern glass at the Corning Museum of Glass. He was appointed curator of European glass in 2016. He graduated with a BA from the University of Cambridge in 2001 and took a post at the Royal Collection, first in the Royal Library and Print Room at Windsor Castle, followed by the Publications Office at St. James's Palace. In 2005, he completed his master's degree in Decorative Arts and Historic Interiors at the University of London and became an assistant curator in the Ceramics and Glass section at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, where he worked for five years on the reinterpretation of the museum's ceramic galleries and um, developing a specialty in 18th century European ceramics with a particular focus in French porcelain. In 2010, he left the VNA, pursued his PhD with, at the University of Glasgow and which he completed in 2014. And after that, um, he came to the United States where he worked at uh, at the Travis Hansen Fine Art Gallery in Beverly Hills until he joined the Corning Museum of Glass in 2016. Most recently, um, he has uh, curated an exhibition and published a book and or catalog. Do you refer to it as a catalog for the exhibition or an accompanying book kit? Accompanying publication. Accompanying <laughs> publication. Um, uh, the exhibition in Sparkling Company um, uh, was supposed to open 
in May of this past year, is that this year? But yeah. thanks, because of the pandemic, it has been postponed. And um, according to the Corning website, it is supposed to open um, in May of this coming year, 2021. We are hoping that that is the case, um, fingers crossed. Um, and we have just posted a link to that book. If you are interested, um, the full title in Sparkling Company, Glass and the Cost of Social Life in Britain during the 1700s is available in the, through the Corning um, bookstore and possibly through others. So if you are interested, the link is in the chat right now. Okay, we will, we will start uh, you, Joanna, if you would be so kind and show us uh, some images of your work and maybe also talk a little bit about what led you from painting where you originally started to glass and what made it interesting to you in particular to what, what focused your interest on the idea of reflection and mirrors. Of course, yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Katia, for um, holding the talk for us and to Kit also for sharing his expertise as well. Um, uh, I'm going to start a little bit from the beginning, um, just to kind of show you the overview um, of the work up until this point. Um, so you, you can kind of understand where I'm coming from with the work that I'm making today. Um, so um, I was originally a painter. Um, I'm just trying to get this to navigate. Oh. There we go, it might be a little slow. And uh, I'm showing some of these images of paintings um, because even before starting um, my career in glass, I was interested in, in using mirrors to create uh, double portraits uh, to reflect the image onto the canvas. And so I, I found that in my career, um, I've come back for full circle to the mirror. Sometimes we feel we make a stride, but we realize that we're kind of interested in these similar focal points. Um, and so I'm gonna show you some um, of my first glass pieces. Um, for some reason, my keyboard isn't working great, but here we go. Um, and I'm showing you these, although they're not incorporating a mirror, you can see that I'm striving to instill the reflection of somebody in the, in the surface of the glass. So this was made in 2005. I'd only really been working in glass for two years at this point. I did a study abroad scheme at Alfred University. And at that point in time, my um, technical abilities were, weren't that great. You know, glass takes years and years in order to kind of harness um, and make what's in your mind's eye um, on the glass blowing pipe or in a mold. Um, so this is just a sandblasted piece of glass. It's about three inches by two inches, uh, very small. And uh, it's just simply oil paint painted on the surface um, of the glass. And this was later refined into the body of work that I made for my um, undergraduate degree at Wolverhampton University. Um, and these uh, painted images, uh, these portraits are actually uh, embedded within the glass. So it's a technique whereby um, a, a, a blown grohl is made, which is essentially a bubble. And then I would paint the surface of that bubble with high fire enamel and then later encapsulate it in glass on the blowing pipe. Um, so um, just a couple of details here. And I just want to draw your attention here to the cast nozzle. Uh, that's situated on the top of the bottle. Uh, usually when you cast glass, you get a very kind of, uh, it's almost like a satin opaque white surface on the glass. And you can see that transparency in this cast piece of glass. And the reason for that is because I actually utilized the crystal manufacturers um, that are very closely situated to my hometown in Shropshire um, in a town called Briley Hill where there are still um, crystal manufacturers today. Um, and I utilized the acid polishing techniques that they use in order to eat away at the surface of that crystal and bring the glass to an optical shine. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because I'm using processes at the moment with my mirrored uh, cast pieces. Um, and, you know, again, using these old age techniques uh, that are, were put, originally perfected for cut glass. Um, so this is an image, um, it's of uh, Sir John Sloan's house. Uh, he was an a British architect. And 
I'm drawing your attention to this image because it was really only um, within my the start of my MFA studies that I truly started to appreciate and look in a little bit into the into the history of the mirrored plane. And I was really interested in how mirrors were used um, to not only amplify the light source in a room in a time when, you know, there was no electricity, uh, the aristocracy would use, you know, uh, highly polished metal cut glass mirrors to bounce the light within a space, but they were also used to suggest excess space and also excess wealth. And I was really interested in that fraudulent kind of inverse sense of reality that existed um, within the mirror surface. And so these are just, I'll quickly go through these images. These are just a few um, uh, images from sketchbooks that culminated to three installations that were in my MFA exhibition. Uh, these are sketches of mylar balloons that look as though they're perspiring in anticipation of being shot. Um, and these are the finished pieces. So you can see here that um, the mylar balloon has been blown in glass, it's been polished, um, and really that's so that the viewer can see their reflection in physically uh, within the object. Um, and this is a, a, this is a kind of a combination between a casting process and a blown process in that I'm blowing the glass into a mold that's been brought up to a thousand degrees. So you get this incredible detail. Um, again, looking at things that are kind of inverted in on themselves. Uh, this is a piece called Inverted Venetus. It's kind of a riff on the uh, Dutch century, the, the Flemish uh, Dutch still life paintings, uh, whereby the painter would perfect, uh, you know, the perfect lemon or um, oyster to give you this kind of sense of reality that you can literally walk into the canvas. And so rather than the frame being the three dimensional part of the painting, everything is reversed. So the, the frame is, um, is a cast piece of glass that recedes into the wall it lays flush with the wall. And then um, the neon light that is um, illuminating these glass pieces draws the eye into that, the center motif, which is this uh, small uh, pomegranate that has a, a, a mirrored interior that can physically um, reflect the viewer. So thinking of, you know, desire, vanity, incorporating the viewer's gaze within the, the flesh of the fruit. Um, so this piece here, this was the first piece that I created after my uh, master's studies. And I think it's a really important piece because it's the starting point uh, to this, uh, not only a technique that I've been refining, but um, the idea that you can create a fully reflective three-dimensional void um, within a cast piece of glass. And where I'm going with this is that, you know, up until this point, really, we've only seen mirrors within flat um, and blown glass surfaces, um, and really only recently within blown glass surfaces. Um, whenever we think of a mirror, we think of a flush, a flat plane on a wall. So what I've been trying to strive for is um, a detailed interior um, within a cast piece glass that can physically um, reflect the viewer's gaze. Um, so this piece was called Distilled Portrait. It was one of uh, four distillery jars. They're cast in solid optical crystal. And what I was trying to do was to create um, jars that contained, contained objects that reflected, um, or I should say, um, were put portraits of individuals in my life. And um, the, the magpie is one of only five species that has the gene for self-awareness and they are perceived as collectors. So I wanted to personify the collector as the magpie, I, identifying it with itself within this jar, this jar you know, that would be used for the containment of, of objects. Um, so here I've got a hollow space of a magpie sitting on a pomegranate within the glass and um, it is coated with a mirror, but as you can see, it really doesn't look like a mirror. Um, that satin surface that's left on the glass inhibits the reflectivity of the mirrored surface. Um, so really it's only glass that has been perfectly polished 
um, that can give you that iridescent quality, that reflective quality within the mirror. So moving forward to a piece that I created for my first uh, solo show in New York uh, at the Agnes Ferris Art Center with Urban Glass. Um, this is a sketch of an oculus window that you would commonly see in a cathedral. And my aim was to um, create segments of glass that held the negative state of spaces and kernels inside that would then be gilded to reflect the viewer within every single grain of wheat. The idea that we're all grains within this complex um, structure that is society. Um, now, uh, the problem was, is that, you know, uh, the wheat literally, quite literally had a granular surface. Um, and because of its um, detail being so tiny, um, it never really truly looked like a mirror. And with these pieces, I actually uh, cast them and had them acid dipped um, at the crystal manufacturers in Briarley Hill in order to remove that satin surface within the glass so that it would look more like a mirror. And it does have more of an iridescent quality, but it still has almost like a stippled um, texture to the glass. So it never really registered as a mirror. And so this is something I've been striving for, for I would say the last uh, eight years now. This is a, um, an overall image of the show at Urban Glass. And these are other pieces that you can see on my website with full uh, conceptual narratives about the work. Um, so with every piece that I've been making um, with the core cast mirrored voids, I feel that I'm getting one step further to this optimal mirrored quality, but I'm not quite there yet. And this is the basis I feel for the PhD studies. I'm, I'm going to be pursuing a PhD um, next year at Sunderland University. Um, so this is a, a globular starburst, as you can see. And um, I made a piece in 2015, which is actually in the show, the Focus exhibition at Heller Gallery. And um, it's called Indra's Web. And Indra's it's Web was right. a I'm complex- interrupt uh, you, Joanne. Oh. It's right behind me, it's the yes. piece. <laughs> so I can show you. So as uh, Katia uh, illustrates so uh, well, um, the piece is right there on the screen. Um, so it's a it's it's riffing on um, a proverb, a Hindu proverb um, about Hin uh, Indra, who was a Vedic god, and he had a, a complex uh, web of jewels that represented society. And the premise is that you know, we are all jewels within this system. With we, we reflect each other and no matter what you do in this world, whether you're a teacher, a lawyer, an artist, everybody is needed in order for society to function. If one of those jewels is plucked out, the rest will, the rest of the net will falter. And so I thought that was a really beautiful narrative. And of course, I felt that it lent itself well to uh, the viewer seeing them within these uh, faceted planes, uh, these jewels. Uh, so this is a, this is the piece of, uh, this is one of the pieces from Indra's web. It's not mirrored, but what you can see here is that I actually faceted the glass so that I would have as smooth a surface as possible uh, to then uh, capture that detail within a refractory mold that would uh, allow a structure of that prism to be um, achieved within a mold that the glass would flow into. It's kind of a complex technique, uh, positive, negative, positive, but um, you can see here, it's a faceted plane within a faceted plane. And this was the finished piece. Uh, it took almost a year to create. Um, and in this detail, you can see just to the, uh, I would say to the bottom right-hand side, as I'm looking at this on my screen, that, it, that mirrored interior has almost like a, it's almost like a desert landscape. It has almost like a crackle to the surface. And that is not um, an issue with the glass at all. That is because the refractory slightly degrades during the firing um, process. And this is not something that I want to go into too technically, um, but these are all um, things that I'm facing with the technique um, in order to create this, um, this reflected void inside the glass. Um, this is a piece called Fix and Urns. It's actually a gilded version of uh, the clear rendition that is also in the Focus um, exhibition. And I would say that it's the closest 
I've managed to achieve in, in terms of getting this reflective surface. Um, what you can't see in the image is that the thinner spheres extend out from the wall one inch further than the, the larger pieces. And what that does is it creates this, uh, it's almost like a magic eye effect. It gives a sense of movement as you encircle the piece and that not every um, glass formation is static against the wall. Um, and it gives this lovely optical quality of light. Um, you can see this little red arrow here that I've marked out for you. You can see that little figure in the, uh, as a reflection. I just wanted to show you that because that's an aha moment for me in terms of trying to, to get the reflection within the, the cast surface. Again, this is a, a mix of acid polishing and hand polishing the surface. I have to grind away um, that satin surface on the glass cast in order for you to even perceive the negative space that's within uh, each form. And uh, these are just a few technical images um, that I wanted to show you because it shows you uh, some of the cut crystal uh, molds that I've been making for a series um, called the Golden Thread that is also in the exhibition. And you can see here the, the shine um, that is captured within the rubber itself. Um, you know, when you uh, use uh, rubber molds to create, you know, a, a rubber mold for wax or refractory, the, 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 more, the, the more polished that surface is, the, the, the better quality uh, the wax or the refractory is uh, when you cast into it. Um, so with, these, with this core casting process, I'm making a mold of the exterior form and also the interior form. Um, so this is the refractory um, that I used to install within the golden thread piece. This is a knotted uh, piece of rope. And as you can see, there is just an incredible amount of detail in this refractory. So even though these pieces were acid polished, there is just so much detail in this piece that you would never be able to physically see yourself within that knot uh, because the, the surface is, uh, is just too uh, irregular. Um, so this is the finished piece. Um, it, as you can see, it's completely transparent. It's, it's cast in uh, optical crystal. Um, it's acid polished. Um, not only does the detail in the rope kind of impinge on the reflectivity, but also the fact that the, the bottle has been further engraved uh, by the master um, glass cutter in Stourbridge. That also gives kind of a, um, an interplay. Uh, it, it, it makes it difficult to register that knot within the glass. Um, here is a detail here of that internal space. So it's only when those bottles are placed together that it acts like a continual landscape. You can see that, th that thread, that knotted thread floating uh, throughout. Um, and the other piece in the series, this, this was a very detailed decanter. And so I actually um, built up a little more wax around the middle section of the bottle so that I could then grind it back um, to create a window for you to actually see uh, the thread within. Um, and this is the golden thread. It's just talking about um, these, you know, secret knots that exist between um, us in life, you know, and how um, things can have a ripple effect. There are secret knots that bind us to others um, in, in this life. So I thought that was quite poetic to install um, the secret knot uh, within a vessel that's used for the spirits, for spirits. So both of these pieces can be seen in the focus show. And um, this is the last um, piece that I'm go going to show today. And I see this body of work more, as, more in the design realm than I do um, in comparison to the other pieces in my portfolio. Uh, this was actually um, initially a body of work that I uh, created um, and collaborated with a, a software designer, Brian Gillespie in Seattle. He works for Rhino Incorporated. And he helped me to um, mill graphite molds. Um, and graphite is a really wonderful material in that it allows you to blow and press mold glass forms. And the glass 
does not stick like it does to regular refractory. So you do get a better surface quality. These have not been um, hand polished internally or, ex or on the exterior either. Um, and the fact that they're a modular shape, there's just an infinite possibility uh, of formations, wall formations that can be created with these forms. Um, so this is the um, extended centerpiece of um, an installation called Morpho Eugenia, which I finished uh, just before having my son in May. So you can see I'm extremely heavily pregnant in this image, but just to show, you know, bump to scale. Um, uh, so, so these are all mirrored internally. And what I love about this piece is it, it forever changes uh, depending on the environment that it's situated in. And um, just to show you a detail here, um, what I should have done is actually uh, given a detail of the, the diamond from the side because there's actually an interior diamond shape within these kites and diamonds uh, that is mirrored and reflects um, the light really beautifully. Um, but I think that is my 10 minutes. And so I'm going to thank everybody and then stop sharing my screen here so that Kit can talk thank about you. Thank you, Joanna, so much for the presentation. <laughs> yes. um, we will, I'm going to ask Kip to show us a little bit about uh, his research and the, uh, and the preparation for the exhibition and the catalog or the accompanying publication. Um, and, and then we can maybe talk a little bit about the ideas behind your work and, the, and what we hear from Kip. Absolutely. Help um, me. There we are. Is that on screen for everyone? Perfect, yes. Perfectly Great. on screen. Marvellous. Well, the, yeah, I'm just going to speak very briefly about, as Katia mentioned, the forthcoming uh, exhibition at Corning, in Sparkling Company, Glass and the Costs of Social Life in Britain during the 1700s. And really the, uh, the aim of the exhibition is to rehabilitate glass uh, in discussions of material culture of this period. This is uh, generally considered to be a period, a golden age for decorative arts in Britain, and it was certainly a golden age for glass production, but the two are never really acquainted in, uh, or equated in general discussions of the period. And I really wanted to delve a little deeper into that. And the accompanying publication, uh, in fact, draws on uh, eight, well, comprises eight contributions by scholars in different fields of 18th century studies, most of whom are not uh, working in the field of glass but all of whom are examining their respective fields through a glass lens. So we have portraiture, fashion, uh, science, slavery, and other things. And my own interest is uh, the equation between uh, the cult of politeness and the polished surface. So what was the cultural significance of um, reflectivity in so much as it was a result of a perfectly smooth and flawless surface? But I mentioned that um, the 18th century was a, a golden age of, uh, for British glass, and it's, I think, important to identify why. And it was really the transition from soda lime glass, um, which had been produced in the Venetian style right the way through uh, to towards the end of the 17th century, and the transition from that to uh, a lead glass or lead crystal, which uh, was really first patented in, in Britain in 1674 by a businessman called George Ravenscroft. And it completely transformed Britain's glass output and the expectations of glass um, on the market. Lead glass is made with a, a high percentage of lead oxide, about 30% uh, in many cases. And so it's particularly clear, particularly heavy, highly refractive, and gives a very pleasant ring when you tap it. And it could, of course, also be easily transported throughout Britain's expanding uh, empire. And it was soft enough because of the lead to allow for um, delicate engraving. Delicate engraving. And you see an example on the, the top right there. But it was also soft enough, enough to allow for cutting. And you get these extraordinary um, prisms that appear um, on lighting and um, personal adornment uh, of the period made from lead glass. And it's no coincidence that this was also the period in which the diamond became the most privileged 
precious stone. There was an influx of diamonds from European colonies in South America um, and India. And London became the diamond uh, capital of Europe, diamond cutting capital of Europe, that is to say. And I think there was a really um, close relationship between the diamond and cut glass during this period. And this cut glass also found its way onto the body, the, the polite or the, the polished body. So people sparkled and glimmered as they moved. This is a detail of a, um, a man's, man's coat from the 1780s, probably made in France, but French fashions were kind of held sway all over Europe. But this notion of the, the polished body is kind of important because movement among the elite was a very carefully studied practice. There were endless manuals teaching you how to walk and how to stand and sit and give your hand and bow and curtsy and so on. So when operating in the hours of darkness, all your movements would be emphasized and accentuated by these sparkling reflective surfaces. And you see them also in jewelry and shoe buckles, in belts, in, in shawl buckles, and all manner of places, and sword hilts. So I began to look through um, visual representations of, of the elite uh, in 18th century Britain, trying to understand a bit more about how they valued glass, how it was used, how it was presented to the world, along with other uh, sort of luxury materials like mahogany, uh, silks, porcelain, oil paintings. I really couldn't find any beyond its material presence in dining and drinking rituals until I realized that so often it is, it is in there, it is present. It's right here in the center of the, the picture in the form of a window. And the 18th century was also an extremely uh, uh, important moment in plate glass production. Um, technical improvements allowed for the production of the sash window. This was a, a late 17th, early 18th century innovation that transformed urban architecture, both cityscapes, but also interiors, which allowed for increasing um, domestic sociability through increased daylight. So plate glass then became a kind of a, a, an interest of mine. And I won't dwell too much on the techniques, but um, casting was a process that didn't really uh, come establish itself in, in Britain until the early 19th century. Technically, it's, it, it's deceptively difficult, so I'm sure we'll get on to, and, and as Joanna's already um, kind of implied. So the British used cylinder plate glass, which basically involved blowing up a bubble of glass, allowing it to elongate through gravity before cutting open the resulting cylinder and allowing it to kind of flatten out into a plate. But the real work, as again, as Joanna has already uh, mentioned, was in the polishing and grinding of this glass to make it suitable for mirrors and also for, for good quality windows. And you can see in the background of this uh, uh, glass grinders workshop, two, two plates that are being framed as looking glasses. And this, I think, really uh, answers the question of what glass meant in the 18th century. And you see it here um, alongside other fashionable accessories, including porcelain, uh, exotic pets, uh, an enslaved black page, sugar and tea. You also see the floor to ceiling sash window and the two oval looking glasses on the wall. And again, it was really the technical innovations that enabled this to, to to happen, to enable the, the, the fashionable interior to absorb glass in this way. And you can see the preoccupation with, with plate glass in this, this design for a wall of a, a fashionable interior, but also just emphasizing the fact that it was the clarity, the direct clarity of the glass without warps or crooks that distorted the view beyond it, that made it suitable for sash windows. And again, similar qualities that made it, made it suitable for giving flawless, flawless um, reflections and looking glasses. In the 18th century, the terms polished and polite were used interchangeably in the language of courtesy uh, and civility. And in fact, Samuel Johnson's dictionary des described uh, polished as meaning A, glossy or smooth, but B, elegant of manners. And so when you look at these 18th century portraits and you see the rather almost lifeless um, appearance of the sitters, they are in fact not psychologically lacking in depth, but they are uh, performing the very um, precise codes of polite behavior 
that required the presentation of this completely flawless, polished exterior, void of any individuality or flaw or irregularity, and being prepared to really reflect the tone of the company that, that, that surrounds them. And this preoccupation with the polished surface in polite society and was remarked upon, particularly in Britain, was remarked upon by foreign visitors to the UK, uh, often in, in relation to wood. Uh, the British um, produced a lot of mahogany furniture. Mahogany was brought in from the Caribbean colonies. And unlike the European counterparts who produced furniture richly um, decorated with marquetry, the British preferred plain mahogany, which was deeply polished. And foreign visitors often compared this to glass. So glass became kind of a benchmark for smoothness and, and quality and politeness. And this is a, a rather amusing uh, portrait of a, um, a young aristocrat, uh, John Lord Mountstuart, on his grand tour. It was painted in Geneva by the, the artist Jean-Étienne Lyotard. And he has decided to be uh, portrayed next to a looking glass as it is such a prestigious item of furniture. Um, as this sort of size looking glass could cost up to the entire gross annual income of a middling family. A middling family would comprise five family members and two servants. So a looking glass was really not an insignificant investment. And in fact, the sitter was charged double the going rate for this portrait because Leotard was obliged to supply a, another, essentially another version of the portrait in the reflection in the flawless looking glass, but it was clearly considered worth it. And probably the, the, the most extraordinary use of plate glass in Britain in the 18th century was the Northumberland House Glass Drawing Room, which was designed by Robert Adam for the Duke and Duchess of Northumberland in 1775. It was entirely covered between dado and architrave um, with plate glass. So you have red stained plate glass reverse spangled with copper flakes interspersed with green glass pilasters and enormous cast plate uh, looking glasses that were imported from France. The room was demolished or dismantled and the panels eventually uh, ended up at the v and and we're bringing the remaining ones to Corning for the exhibition um, and combining them with the, the design drawings coming from Sir, Sir John Soane's museum, in fact, in London. And also we've embarked on a virtual uh, reality reconstruction of the room and you can see a kind of screen grab of it uh, on the right here. But mirror glass was really important also in diplomatic exchange. Europeans sent mirror glass to, to Asia um, from their earliest encounters there, where it was highly prized. In Asia, there wasn't such a, a tradition of blown glass, let alone plate glass production. And the Chinese with their strong tradition of graphic arts um, quickly expanded the European tradition of reverse painted glass by scraping off the foiling or the silvering of the, of the reverse of mirrors and replacing it with painted designs which in turn became really fashionable back in Europe. So there's this incredible oceanic footprint with plate glass being taken from Europe to China for painting and then being uh, brought back to, to Europe, which is a journey which could take um, up to two years. I suppose of all the looking glasses in the 18th century, the most iconic is the toilette mirror. Um, and it's really interesting to dwell on the notions of identity associated with this piece of um, looking glass. Um, on the top right, we see Queen Charlotte at her toilette. Um, she is depicted fully dressed, fully prepared for public display. And she is turning away from the looking glass to give attention to her two sons. Um, so she's turning her back on any association of vanity or preoccupation with her own image. Um, but to emphasize that, you also see her reflection cast in almost as a classical cameo. Uh, in the looking glass, emphasizing her noble virtue, which is totally in contrast to the, um, the image of the Countess in William Hogarth's Marigella Mode, where the Countess, newly married, newly moneyed, sits uh, with a coterie of attendants, male and female, in a state of semi-undress, um, completely absorbed in herself and her own affairs. And in the center, we see um, a macaroni, it's British, aristocrat returned from his grand tour of Europe, adopting French fashions and Italian manners, which have clearly been ridiculed uh, by the presence of the looking glass and the, the toilette and the oval looking glasses as well uh, on the walls. In the top left, we see uh, a portrait uh, of Lady Impey, the wife of the governor of 
British territories in India, supervising her household. The style of this is very much in a, a, a Mughal, very much a Mughal miniature. Um, and you can see that Lady Impey has adopted certain Indian customs, but the toilet glass, the looking glass and the toilet table uh, very much underscores or affirms her European identity and her recognition that, that is still a, a, a principal identity. Underneath is a rather um, a, a kind of a disturbing image that reflects the, the tensions that surrounded the notion of the toilette and making up uh, in the new world in racially mixed societies where there was great anxiety around um, uh, transgressions as it's perceived, movement from one race to another, dis dissimulation. And looking glasses were very often concealed in pieces of furniture, as you can see in the bottom left here. But just to conclude, the, the looking glass or mirrored surfaces in the 18th century were more than um, just, uh, just, but more than uh, accessories in, to polite life. They also enabled Britain's global expansion. Um, lighthouses, for example, were entirely dependent upon developments in mirrored surfaces as reflectors, but also as, in, as, as lenses too for projecting light. And there was a crossover between science and um, the fashionable world. The polemoscope you can see on the left here was designed initially for military use. It uses a, incorporates a clever combination of lenses and mirrors, which enable the user to essentially look around the corner while appearing to look straight ahead. They didn't put, uh, prove particularly effective for military purposes, but were readily adopted in London's uh, growing opera and theater scene, where they became uh, must have accessories for the, the curious and prime. And that is the, the end of uh, my gallop through in Sparkling Company. There are so many connections and I know that um, Katia is keen to, to make them. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that. Um, we, I, I can't wait to see the show. That should be really interesting. Um, I am just, so I wanna, first of all, I wanna just uh, ask both of you, um, you know, in, in the idea of reflection, in the historic sense, um, we even spoke about this earlier, you know, there's this idea of the commodification of light, um, that light became something that was uh, not only desirable, but also saleable, um, and that it became an economic um, factor. Um, and, and glass and mirrors helped make it more permanent, right? It, your investment in the mirror or the chandelier was something that would magnify something of a resource that needed to be renewed all the time, like a candle or eventually a light bulb. Um, so that's one thing I want to talk a little bit about. And Joanna, I also want to talk a little bit about the idea that reflection um, is uh, not only the physical act of reflection in the glass, but that it also provides space for self-reflection, right? And as I want to know how, as an artist, you are using that. So if we can maybe, where, wherever you want to start, that's. Uh, well, I, shall I go first with the historical sure. bit? Sure. <laughs> um, but you're, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The light, light was a commodity. Um, uh, in, in cities, for example, in London in particular, the, 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 the new political setup of Britain in the 18th century required arist the aristocracy to be present in London to take their seats in Parliament to participate in government, which meant that they were occupied for the day so that eating and social life had to take place later when it was darker. Um, and lighting a dining room, for example, in the 18th century could cost as much as a glass worker earned in a, in a week. It was just in candles. And then of course you had to have the attendants to tend to the candles to replace them, to extinguish them, to clean the surfaces after their use. So you know, there were many knock-on expenses. But the, the, the wonderful thing about the mirrors and also the leg glass that's faceted is that it adds this extra layer of theatricality that it's not just practical, that, it, that the social space also becomes performative as a result. You get these vistas, but because the light is so, even with candles blazing, uh, we were talking yesterday, light levels were still comparatively low. So you get these sort of windows onto possible other worlds, um, as well as the sparkle and, and, and glimmer of the, the fabric. Especially when, 
especially when people dressed in things that also reflected the light, right? Somebody, exactly. posted, somebody posted in the chat that they wish they had that coat. Um, <laughs> there we all, yeah. Yes, um, because, it, because it is such a sparkling um, thing. And, and in that portrait of the family, of the couple with the, uh, with the satin gown, and there seems to be some kind of a satin piece coming out of the coat, of the husband's coat, they also seem very highly reflective. Exactly, and that's the, that's the reason why movement deportment was so carefully studied, because you know, if you're shimmering and twinkling and everyone's kind of, if you're drawing attention to yourself, you have to be able to navigate a room and handle your knives and forks and you know, dance in the correct way. Otherwise, everyone will see your blunders. I wonder if, if we could perhaps recreate some kind of a situation like that in conjunction with the exhibition. I think we ought. <laughs> <laughs> and and jo so, Joanna, with the idea of reflectivity like that, do you, um, do you think about how you use it in terms of self-reflection also, or not just self as in you, but as in your viewers and anybody who is looking at a piece like that? Yeah, well, I think that um, mirrors beckon the gaze, and I use that as a device to to lure people in, I would say, and I would hope that in that moment of, you know, seeing yourself within a detailed entity that is not just a, a flush piece of glass, that there is space for viewers to ask questions, pause, and see themselves within a bird or a wheat grain and maybe have more of a realization of, I mean, every piece has its own connotation, but the human condition in of itself mm -hmm. or the society as a whole, or, you know, um, so I think obviously glass is an incredibly beautiful material and it is almost like a desire mechanism in of itself. It's sexy, it, it kind of sparkles, it captures light. The mirror, you know, beckons everybody in to see themselves within something that it's that then it's like, oh, well, why am I inside this wheat husk within a rose window? You know, it's uh, I think it, it's just uh, my way of uh, getting the viewer to pause and, and literally reflect, reflect in their own reflection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting, even in the language that we use, right? To see oneself in a in a grain or in something, it's 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 both metaphorical and physical. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of the beauty in your work. Is is that we have a our first question here? We know that mirrors were expensive, but could you put that into context? What did one cost versus the average person earned versus what the average person earned? I guess that's a question for Kit. Well, if we say, if we talk about the middling classes, which in fact, you know, the, the middling classes and the elite made up probably no more than 5% of the population, but the middling classes, the people who would have lived in a city, uh, the lawyers, the doctors, so on and so forth, they would have had um, maybe around 200 pounds gross income a year. Um, the Duke of Northumberland spent over 2000 pounds on his plate glass mirrors from France. So an extraordinary amount. Um, a, a more that, modest- that, that, that's, sorry, that's again that, that room that you were showing, Kit. Exactly, yeah. Those vast imported plate glass um, mirrors but on which he had to pay 75% import tax. Um, but a more modest mirror, <laughs> I mean, to put it also into context, a more modest mirror could cost maybe 30 to 50 pounds, which was also about the same as um, so my research is also focused a lot on des dessert tableware and sugar production and so on. So the, this, this equation relates to that, but that's about as much as a, um, a, a slave cost in the, in the new world. So it was a, a significant investment. Right. right. Um, and so did, and did people, um, there was also, I read that in your, actually in your essay, that there was also tax on, on glass, on windows, right? On light? 
Yeah, the, there was tax in Britain until the 1840s. And um, yeah, it was really prohibitive. On windows. Is that right? Yeah, on windows, exactly. And it, um, so people boarded up, they were bricked up their windows to avoid paying that tax, which of course resulted in all sorts of health problems, particularly because it was the poorest people who as ever suffered the most. And it was really the lifting, the great exhibition, the famous Crystal Palace, that was only really made possible because of the uh, abolition of the window tax. Um, mm, so that was kind of a, a celebratory moment for play. Yes, very celebratory. Um, okay, thank you. And there's a question for Joanna. Could you explain a bit more about the technique to cast the image of the rope inside the vessel? This is from Bill Weisberger. Hello, Bill, how are you? Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so I use two, I would say I use two different techniques when it comes to what I call core casting, when you create a void inside the glass. One is hanging core molds and the other is surface core molds. And so a hanging core mold would be um, something that is fully enveloped in glass, um, such as the bird, you know, um, and with those pieces, as I did with the rope um, inside the, the decanter, I made a, a two-part rubber mold of the decanter and a two-part rubber mold of the rope configured in the shape I wanted. And I make a, a hollow wax of the decanter. Um, I need it to be hollow so that I can install the refractory core inside it. And then I make um, a plaster silica uh, refractory uh, rope. Uh, so I, you know, pour that refractory into the, the void of the rope mold. And once that's set, um, this is in a nutshell, but I, you know, I install don't, that. Don't try this at home. No. It, <laughs> or take a class at Corning with me next year. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, so you install the rope inside the, the wax. And believe me, it those, those rope pieces are so fragile, it took, it takes many, many attempts because they have to be reinforced with metal inside uh, because as, uh, as the and glass- And to be prevented from floating, right? Isn't that correct? Yes. Cork, yeah. Yeah, so, so I install, you know, wires and metal uh, inside the core before it's poured. So I have to make sure that the metal's not exposing itself on the refractory because the metal will break the glass. Um, and once that's set and I've got a successful knot, then that goes into the, the wax decanter and it's set in place. Um, and then finally, I make another refractory mold around the entirety of the bottle uh, that catches onto each side of the knot. Um, so, you know, the knot is exposed outside of the bottle. Um, and then uh, the, the wax is lost wax cast, you know, it's, it's steamed out of the mold and then glass is placed into the, the top of the mold. It pours in at peak temperature. It circulates the core, the rope, but it can't penetrate it. And then after the firing, after the annealing, uh, all of that refractory is picked out by hand uh, with dental tools and water picks. Um, and then uh, everything is hand polished on the outside. And with those pieces, they're also acid polished so that that interior space can be gilded. And, and the interesting thing is that you can kind of see the hollow from the side of these bottles. They are three dimensional objects, and you can see the hollow, the tunnel, if you will, yeah. the rope. From, um, from the side, you can see in through where the rope. I'm, I'm sorry, Bill. Can you say you that see, again? You can see into the where the rope comes out from the side of the vessel, which we couldn't in the front view. Exactly. Um, and we have. Um, thank you, Joanna. And, and we have a really great question from Jane Cook. Um, I'm curious to hear from both their thoughts on the contrast between elegance and purity evoked by the polished mirrors historically with the current obsession with ubiquitous displays such as the selfie. Um, what do you say? Should, should I start? Sure, why yeah. don't you start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, getting to purity and opticality, um, it's painful to get to the purity and the opticality 
nobody wants big bubbles in their glass casting. They don't, you know, we don't want to inhibit that reflection. And so it, again, it takes uh, some time to get to that, that state, the perfect bottle that can be flawlessly polished, scratch free and bubble free so that you can see yourself inside the, the core. And I mean, yeah, I mean, people love to see themselves in their phones and hopefully in my glass pieces too. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's become so commonplace to see your reflection, whether it's in a screen or in a mirror, you know, I mean. I, mean, I think the interesting part is that in a mirror, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a passing moment, right? when you see yourself in a mirror, you can, if you have a mirror installed in the same place, you can go by it as many times a day as you like. But, mm. um, but, but if you capture it as a selfie, um, it's something that exists not as a passing image, but as a, some, there's some sense of permanence to it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kit? I, I think the, ref the reflective surface, the smooth or polished reflective surface, in the 18th century, that wasn't considered um, showy. Um, gaudy was a term that was used to describe excess of color or ornament, but the smooth polished surface was actually a, a, more equated with simplicity. Um, and I love, John, I really love, I made a note of it. It was such a great uh, uh, encapsulation, this fraudulent sense of reality. Um, yes, flown. Yeah, it is so the, the, to such an extent as, does the labor lie hidden by the effect? But that was, it was a, more, these surfaces were not showy or blingy as we might consider them now, but more of a simplicity and purity. It's, it's also interesting that in, in, the, in the image of the Sloan interior that Joanna showed, those mirrors are really relatively small, right? Relative to the, but, but as placed as impactfully as possible, of course, um, but relatively small. Um, to let's say the interior that you showed Kit, which is like completely <laughs> laden with mirror. But I, Jane, are you with us? Can you unmute yourself if you are? I don't know if she's here with us. Jane, no, maybe not. Anyway, um, I just, I wanted to see what, what their um, um, sense of the, answer to that question is about the the contrast between elegance and purity and historically and the selfie um anyway um is it hello hello did Jane? that work yes hi yes that worked now uh, can you hear me now yes we can ah, I'm, I'm fighting with i'm on my phone eating eating dinner oh okay bon appetit <laughs> merci um, no, the, the, the question is, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a very personal question for me because of, I mean, my time working in research and development at Corning Incorporated um, uh, in the early 2000s, I had a, a, a fairly uh, significant contribution to the existence of the screens that you're all looking at, uh, for better or for worse. And uh, I'm always uh, curious to hear the, we'll the call opinion. that for the better. <laughs> yeah, the opinions of experts on that and, and various points of view on, uh, on, on the value or lack thereof of, uh, of seeing ourselves so much. I, th I think the, the, the point about that we, we, we up until, in, Kit, you might know the, the dates on this, when did people actually begin to see themselves in mirrors generally in the general populace? It really wasn't until just a few hundred years ago, I believe, right? But yeah, I mean, certainly if you're looking in mirror glass, so as you know, obsidian, polished obsidian and so on goes, goes back for millennia, but yeah, polished looking glass would not have been available in great quantities to the, the general populace until the, the 19th century. And I guess the, the other thing I would uh, comment on is uh, in the process of making these sheets of glass that, that, you're, that you're all looking through right now, um, they are uh, thousands to a million times flatter and smoother and more pure than the glass, the very best glass that was being made even a century ago. So in order to create the, the, these 
ubiquitous, somewhat crass selfie images. It actually takes uh, a, a technology, and it wouldn't work if you didn't have that level of, of perfection. And yet we put that to perfect perfection to, uh, to duck faces and, uh, and emoji. It's, uh, it's a little disconcerting. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I, I actually have a question there. It, is it possible to get some kind of an app where the where the screen of my cell phone would basically turn itself into a mirror rather than a camera? Uh, you can. Um, you you have the opportunity to uh, to flip to flip the image. Right, I, I understand. But that's but I'm looking at a camera there, right? I was I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, is there a way to kind of like bring an artificial silvered surface behind somehow a pixelated oh, surface oh gosh. behind that and create a mirror out of the front of my cell phone screen. Uh, if you'd like to commission a research project, I could probably come up with something. <laughs> All right, <laughs> now three we're years, Three years and $10 million, but we should talk. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or you could, I mean, put a, you could put a mirror on the back of your case so you could just turn the phone over. Right, that's true, you can do that. <laughs> it's or, you could, or you can, Address the, uh, the 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 uh, the the black mirror, uh, the, the the heart of the, oh, yes. the, the <laughs> analogous to the Fred Wilson pieces. You mean? Well, it, it also to the uh, to the science fiction horror uh, television. Oh, 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 that black mirror. <laughs> I see. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Catherine. Thank you as well. Um, okay, we are we are at time. Actually, I'm going to just say if anybody else has any other questions, please post them. Um, we have a, a very nice thank you from Antonio Pires. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to attend this meeting. Congratulations to the presenters. Um, so thank you everybody. If there are no other questions, I'm going to say thank you to Joanna and Kit for participating. Kit, I'm sorry if we kept you up very late. I no, it feels like I have a social life. It's nearly 10 o'clock and I'm up and talking and Marvelous. Thank well, you for inviting we, me. We, we would be happy to contribute to that anytime. <laughs> Joanna, thank you so much. I hope your children are not missing you too much. No, no, no. They're um, fine. And, and I'm just going to say that uh, the three of us, if I'm not mistaken, are all non-US citizens, but we all have been come to the United States either as immigrants or seats uh, for work and study and I'm just going to say vote everybody please next week I'm sending you to the polls on our behalf so we can still stay here or come back here anyway thank you very much for being with us um, we will see you um, sometime soon again um, thanks for joining thank you bye bye kids bye bye Joanna bye everybody bye, bye Jane Hi, Jane. Thank you for the great question. And to everybody. <laughs>